great human being. Um, the first time I met her, um, I knew that she was a good person. You know how you can just see things through like, you know, more than your physical eyes. You can just you can just tell. You know, you just you just know like that's a it's a good egg, right? It's a good person. I could tell Vasavi was a good person. Um, and fate brought us back together, uh, you know, not too long ago. And I just know that life is so short and so valuable. And I thought that this would be the perfect opportunity to invite Vasavi to come to the stage and tell her story. So come on down. Funny. I was looking at the calendar and today is <clears throat> May 24th, exactly two months ago, like to the date, I was doing massive amounts of cocaine and drinking in my kitchen counter, um, off my kitchen counter, and so I just think it's really funny that uh, how things work out now two months later, um, I now am a little over 60 days sober and I'm here speaking at a sober bar, so that's pretty great. Um, and then also, I just wanted to say thank you to all of you for um, coming out. It is a Friday night, and I don't know about you, but I know my Friday nights were usually drinking cheap, you know, gas station boxed wine at home, uh, doing, you know, cocaine or, you know, being out somewhere on uh, South Lamar and getting drunk. So I just think it's really cool that we're all here today, so thank you so much. And then, okay, you have to know how me and Chris met. It's crazy. So I, uh, a few months ago, I was a co-host of a morning show here in Austin, Studio 512, it was on KXAN in CW Austin, and I booked Chris to come on the show to make mocktails, and at the time, I was um, supposed to still be in recovery and be sober, and Chris comes on and we're talking about the sober life, and I lied to Chris, and I told him I was sober because I was ashamed that I was not sober anymore, um, because with you know, sobriety and relapse comes a lot of shame and humiliation. And so I lied to Chris's face. I'm so sorry about that. I think you already knew that. This is not the first. Yeah, this is not the first time. So that was like maybe I, I yeah, like maybe five, six, yeah, like yeah, maybe five months ago. So then, um, just two months ago, I had uh, checked myself back into rehab at uh, Recovery Unplugged here in Austin. It was my second time back in rehab for alcohol and cocaine and. Uh, I am sitting in rehab, I have like, okay, so I'm not all dressed up with like my makeup on like I was when he met me when I was on the set of, of Studio 512 as a co-host. I was sitting in rehab with baggy sweats, dirty hair, fleece on, and we have our you know, nightly meeting, and guess who comes in to speak? It's Chris. So I'm like, holy shit. I've been caught, and I feel like an idiot, and it was, it, it was still so humiliating at the time because that's just the shame that comes about with the relapse and then having to go through this process again. But Chris, being who he is, was like, oh, did you get the email that I sent you about coming to speak at the Sands Bar? I'm like, no, I you know, got let go of my job and I'm in rehab. So no, I didn't get your email. <laughs> so I do think it's great how things work out, Chris. And um, I do want to say, you know, thank you for kind of seeing through that physical exterior. And um, Devin, this is my good friend Devin, he shows up. There you go. Okay. So, so I do think it's it's so important that as we go through life and we meet people that we do see through that physical exterior and we do see them for the for the goodness inside of them. And um, I know that when I sit like in your seat and I've heard speakers on stage, um, I'm an entrepreneur and so I've gone to a lot of conferences and I hear a lot of people speak. Um, I'm always like, what qualifies them to be up on stage and speak? And so just a little bit about me. Um, I was born and raised in New York, but I'm not a dick. I mean, I can be. I definitely can be a dick, but I was born and raised in New York. Um, my parents are Indian immigrants. They came over here in the 70s. Um, and so I was raised with very good morals and values, um, work ethic, character. But I never quite felt like I belonged. I was I was uh, raised on Long Island, New York. We were the only Indian family 
in an all white town. And so how many of you, of you have ever walked into a room? Like, like you could go anywhere, right? And you just feel like, I don't belong here. I mean, if you have, can you raise your hand, please? So I'm not alone, thanks. Great, all, okay, almost all of us. So that was my life, like pretty much my entire life. I'd always be like, I just don't belong here. I just didn't feel comfortable with, like, with myself in any situation, and especially in my skin. Um, and therein lies the problem, and therein lies the solution, which for me was drugs and alcohol. Drugs and alcohol always made everything better. I'm bored, go get a bag of cocaine. I'm bored, go get some alcohol. I'm uh, lonely, go find a guy to have sex with, right? Like, it was always something, there was always something outside of me that could, that could solve, solve that emptiness within. Um, and in order to overcompensate, like wanting to feel like a piece of shit, I did a lot of things. So I have two masters. I um, have a master's in social work. I'm a licensed social worker. I went to Columbia University in New York, like a good little Indian girl. I got that Ivy League education. <laughs> I um, got married to a nice Indian man when I was 28 and promptly got divorced three years later. <laughs> Um, and I just did all the right things, you know, and I started my business in 2010 working with artists and creatives and entrepreneurs to really help them get their message out there, get their voice out there, and just really have like good strategy when they're putting their, you know, businesses out there. All that was fine and dandy um, until I got divorced because here's the thing, like I didn't get divorced and go to Barnes and Noble and like get a book on like how to deal with divorce. I just was like, I'm going to get divorced. This is not helping me out. Like, like this. This marriage is not good for us anymore. I didn't know how to deal with it. And so I got divorced and said, I need to spend alone time. And promptly, like two weeks later, I met a guy. And I moved him in three, three months later. So it's just really funny, like when we say we want one thing and then something else happens and then it just completely distracts us from what we're really meant to be doing. And so the past four years, I'm just giving you guys like the really like a bridge version of this. The past four years, you know, this relationship that I was in really kind of brought me uh, to my knees um, on so many levels, right? Like I, I had never really like had a problem with alcohol and drugs until I met the person that I was dating who was my rebound, who ended up, you know, I ended up uh, dating him for almost four years. Um, but my cocaine addiction was at first like on a Friday night and I'm like, I got it under control. It's just social. I was making a lot of money in my business and I'm like, I got it under control. It's only one day a week. That's how it always starts. And then it's like, this shit is really good. Let's do it on Saturday. And then it's like, wait, it's Tuesday. Let's get fucked up. And so it just became one day a week, two day a week, three day a week, four day a week. And then it just became, you know, to the point where like I needed it all the time because not having it was torture. Not having it was torture. And, and having to be with myself sober was just absolute, um, just an absolute nightmare for me. So I did go to rehab the first time in 2017, uh, uh, I don't even remember, it feels so long ago, October, and then I was sober, and then um, when I got out of rehab the first time, this is a really important note here, um, I was healthy, like I was sober, I, I had a few months under my belt, I was like at least three or four months sober then, you know, and like that was the longest I'd been sober, and I thought, okay, I'm healthy, I'm gonna like reconnect with my ex, and we're gonna make this relationship work. How many of you have ever gotten like healthy in your life and think it's your job or responsibility to bring all the sick people along with you? Like thinking like you're gonna be Mother Teresa. I mean, I did. And I, and I thought like, okay, I'm gonna make this relationship work. And so, you know, the biggest problem for me was that um, it was really hard for me to be alone. And I even have index cards because I'm an alcoholic and an addict and I also have bipolar disorder, so my thoughts are not very linear. Um, and so I have index cards because I really want to get the point across here. Mm -hmm. So my first problem, because Chris said we have to talk about our problems that we faced and the solution and how community helps. So first problem, and if any of you can relate to this, just let's just like nod our heads or just something because I think it's really important when it comes to community that we know that we're not alone because isolation is like, it, it, it is the thing that leads to relapse. It is the thing that leads us to like want to kill ourselves. It is the thing that like makes us feel like who gives a shit anymore, right? So my number one problem, like I would say that just basically sums up all of it, and I had tons of problems, um, was that I couldn't be alone. So can any of you relate to that? Like just like, yeah, like being alone, like I could not Netflix and chill. 
There was no chilling for me. There, there was not even any Netflix thing because every time I would just be sitting by myself, like wanting to just, you know, have alone time, um, it was really difficult for me because I don't know about you, sorry, got my index cards here. Um, I don't know about you, but like being alone with the thoughts in my head can kill me. Right? It just it just felt like it was like a slow death, like being by myself. I mean, and I live in a really nice house. I have nice things, we have nice clothes, everything on the outside looks really good. Okay? But leave me to my own devices by myself in my house on a Friday night at like seven o'clock by myself. I wanna kill myself. And I'm like, I need something for I, I need something. I need something so this feeling would go away. And so um, that was my biggest problem and that is what I truly believe was the ultimate reason why I did relapse. And so rather than just be alone and like learn to enjoy myself and my presence, I just brought along whatever trash was, you know, was, was in front of my door. And I hate to say that, but I know for me, and I love my father because he taught me this when I was a very young age. At a very young age, he said, if you roll in the mud with pigs, you're gonna get up smelling like shit. And that was my biggest problem, is that I rolled in the mud with pigs and I wondered why I always smell like shit. Oh, I can hang out with people that do, you know, cocaine and drink, and I'm not gonna do it. Yeah, fucking right. That is not like who am I to even think that I have that kind of self control? I don't. And so, you know, being mindful of the people that I associate myself with, which is why community is so important, is probably the greatest um, gift that I've given to myself. But um, here's here's a solution. I have solutions for if, if if it's hard for you to be alone. Number one is to schedule alone time. Um, so my fiance Ben is sitting over there. He's just he's just uh, taping me, and I always say to him at least a few times a week, like, I need some alone time. So I'm gonna like need to be alone, and like I make I make it a point to let him know. I make it a point to let him know I need my alone time. That was not the case a few months ago. A few months ago it was like, please don't leave me. Like please don't go like live your life. Please come hang out with me because I can't be without you. I can't be without someone pacifying me and coddling me and just like, I just need a warm body. And so now it's really important that I schedule the alone time. So I don't know where you're at as far as your alone time-ish is concerned, but if you are gonna uh, schedule your alone time, make your alone time enjoyable, right? So, so like whatever you do, make it great. Like, you know, if you're gonna cook, play some Ella Fitzgerald. You know, if you're if, if if you're gonna go for a walk, like take your dog or whoever, or you know, like go walk on the green belt or you know whatever, like whatever you do, like if you want to go, like have dinner by yourself or lunch, like it's amazing, like take a great book with you, like go get some gelato, like do something, like 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 date yourself, right? And so that for me is huge, and I have to say this, like I actually like being alone more than I like being with people. And I know that sounds awful, but I actually think that's like a huge, thank you, you don't even have to do that. No, but like, it, it feels good that I, like, not that I don't wanna be around people, but it's like, it's, it's a complete 180. You know what I mean? Like I enjoy being with myself, and now I'm allowing people in rather than needing to have them in. There's a big difference. Um, third thing is, get to the root of the fear. This is a licensed social worker in me that will always say if you're afraid of anything, you know, like afraid of being alone or, you know, or like afraid of being rejected or whatever, like get to the root of it. Like don't just say like, I'm gonna put a sexy band-aid. Hi, I'm gonna put a sexy band-aid over my fear and it's gonna go away. Like it's not, that's just, that's just sugarcoating it. You need to understand why, like why? Like why do you feel this way? Like where did it come from? Like. Like you have to understand yourself. So like when you spend alone time with yourself, which is what I've been doing, is like I'm really starting to get to know myself and get to the root of all my drama that has like allowed me to suffer for so many unnecessary years. So getting to know yourself and getting to the root of the fear will happen through alone time or a great therapist. Um, so, you know, whatever you have to do. And then also <coughs> welcome the fear um, I know these all sound like Instagram memes, like, you know, welcome to fear, but it really <laughs> is true. Like, like you do have to welcome your fear instead of being like afraid of it, just like stop, be mindful and be like, okay, so what's going on right now? Like talk to yourself, be gentle with yourself like you would with a baby or, or a friend. Okay, problem number two. I should have put these in some sort of order. Problem number two is huge. Also, um, blaming others for my current situation so whatever situation I was in when I was heavily using cocaine 
I blamed my cocaine dealer for living too close. Or, you know what I mean? Or, or I would blame my ex-boyfriend for not, for, you know, because like he wouldn't stop me from using it and he was using it with me. Like there was always someone to blame for why I was the way I was. Like if I wasn't happy, it's because you didn't do this. Or if, if, if I've gained weight, it's because it's too hot to run outside. Like there was, like, you know, I blame everything. Um, other than, you know, so like rather than just taking responsibility for myself, not, not finding fault, it's not about like self-flagellation, um, it really is about understanding like how, like where do I fit in in all of this? Um, and so blame can show up on in so many different ways. So I will say this, I will just completely out myself. So I've been in therapy since I was 12 years old. I'm 37, I'm fucking 25 goddamn years in therapy. And my therapist, <laughs> said to me um, two, three days ago, she goes, Vasavi, like, you're hiding behind therapy. You need to go live your life. Stop intellectualizing everything that you do. Stop questioning every move that you make. You already know what you need to do. And she's so right. I'm, you know what I mean? Like, I'm not too shabby up here. I'm, I'm not an idiot, you know what I mean? But it's like this constant, reassurance checking from other people, needing that validation. Is this right? Is this the right decision? Is this the right? No, we already know the answer. Um, we do. And so the solution for blaming others, sorry, the, the solution for blaming others for our current situation, I have a few things. Number one, take 100% responsibility every single time. What does that look like? Okay, perfect example is traffic, right? We all love Austin traffic, right? And so it's so easy to blame people from California coming to Austin and they're making traffic really bad. It's always, you know, like, God, I hate people from LA and blah, 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 whatever. How about you account for traffic and you leave early and then you don't have to bitch and moan the whole way in your car, right? And so, I, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's just, and it also, we just- just have some fun and smile with the person next to you. Yeah, we're yeah, all in this together. Yeah, like, smile. Like, up, listen. I will be the first person to say that I absolutely love traffic. I listen to audiobooks. I talk to my mom. I even FaceTime with my dad. I put him in the cup holder while I'm driving. And I'm like, don't worry, I'm not looking at you. But like, if you're going to be stuck in traffic, like make the best of it instead of bitching and moaning. So thank you for saying that. Um, number two is pause, breathe, look within. I haven't breathed at all like this entire time. Sorry. But uh, I'm not taking responsibility for that. So. Uh, but, you know, any time you feel yourself like looking outwards, and I found this too, you know, what's really been helping, like if I want to blame Ben for something, he's the sweetest guy in the world, and I want to like blame him for, you know, taking away my happiness or whatever. And you know what, do I still do that from time to time? I absolutely do that. I'm not perfect, and I really appreciate you saying that when you came up to speak, is like, this is not about perfection, this is about progress, you know? But what I'm finding is that when I slow the F down, and I breathe, and I look within and I ask myself, what's actually going on here? What need is not being met? Because I believe that when our needs are being met, when we find a way, first of all, when we can express what our needs are and then we get our needs met, everything just happens to work out. But we need to know what our needs are rather than blaming somebody else and making somebody else solve our problems for us. It's just not gonna happen. Um, and then number three, my sponsor just said this to me. Oh, I have the best sponsor, by the way. I just, oh my God, I wish she was here. She's wonderful. I just, we, she's, um, like I just digress for a second because one of the excuses I had for not having a sponsor is like, I was like, I needed someone who's much older and who had many more years of sobriety. This chick is like, I think she might be like 10 years younger than me and she has six and a half years of sobriety. And I've never admired someone more and been like, I want whatever it is that she has. So. You know, health is everywhere, community is everywhere. Hi, welcome. Yeah, so um, I just have to dig, you know, digress. And so anyway, she's the one that said to me, when we were talking about blaming others for our current situation, take the next right step. You know what? It's 2019, we really need to stop playing dumb. You know what I mean? We all know what the next right step is when we pause, breathe, look within. We know what the next right step is. Um, and so, I'm like hot right now. Hold on. Like, new Christmas lights can burn me up. All right. I got the last problem here. Okay, my last problem. Okay, I know I said every single problem has been has been huge. 
but this by far has been the hugest, like so huge. You ready? Yeah? Okay. Too much knowledge, not enough practice. Huge, I mean, talking from the girl who has 25 years of therapy under her belt, too much knowledge, not enough practice, so I don't even know where to begin. Like, you know, when I was in my heavy usage, I'd be like, I need to stop, I don't know what to do. And, and like my friends would be like, get rid of your boyfriend, he's an addict. And I'm like, no, but you don't understand. <laughs> like, the excuses that I had, I'm like, I knew in my heart that was the right thing to do, but I didn't because I thought that it was my job to love someone more than it was to love myself. So, and, and I thought it made me a better person to love someone more than I love myself. And I obviously know that that is not the case. Um, and so to know is not to be. And I gotta say, uh, the reason why I wanted to share with you guys, like in the very beginning, how Chris and I met, like he met me on the you know, set, Studio 512, looking all you know, perfectly coiffed, you know, to, head to toe, looking great externally, because I'm really all about keeping up my external appearances, but don't look inside. I don't want you to see what's inside, right? And so for me, um, this entire process of this second time around through recovery has really been an inside out process. You know, for me, um, yeah, I still like to look nice. I still like to have my house in order. I still, you know, like I still take care of my stuff on the outside, but the focus is so much more on what is going on inside of me and that and that you know not to quote Gandhi because he's Indian and I'm Indian but you know if you know you have to be the change that you want to see in the world right and so for me really like changing from the inside out and like I wish I could ex I mean I wish I could tell you how but I have to say the biggest thing really is you know spending that alone time taking responsibility for yourself slowing down and taking all the knowledge that you already have. Um, and so the solution, if you if, if you are someone where your self-help has become shelf help, right? So you know there's a lot of self-help <laughs> book and like all you just see is like, like it's all on your bookshelf. Like all these books on how to heal your inner child and how to have higher self-esteem and how to get women and how to date and how to have more confidence. All this shit's just on your bookshelf, right? And so it's like really looking at the knowledge like you already have all the answers. Um, uh, identify the top three inactions you haven't been taking. So right now, in your head, as I'm talking, just like you can ignore me for a second, to think about like what are three things, one to three things in your life that you know you've been saying, God, I really need to be doing this. Like I really need to be handling this. I haven't handled this. I haven't had that conversation. I haven't paid this off. Like whatever it is, that's the thing that you know, needs to happen because I don't think we are meant to, I don't think God put us on this earth for us to walk, walk this earth burdened, you know, and just have unnecessary stress on our shoulders for no reason. And as, and as someone who has created controlled chaos in her life, because like for the fun of it, you know what I mean? Like I enjoy chaos so I can fix it and then be the hero of my life. It is just not fun and will, and it is, it is bound to cause a relapse. Um, and so for me, that's why, um, taking the action, doing what I know I need to be doing, and not like checking in with everyone and their mom, and definitely not checking in with my therapist, um, is something that I've been practicing and I hope you do too. Um, number two, stop intellectualizing. Uh, if you're brainy like I am and you operate from the heart up mostly, so if you're mostly up here all the time, a lot of thinking, um, you know, it's good in, 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 in it is good to do that in certain situations. It is not the best way to live when we are trying to lead a heart-centered life and we're trying to be kinder to ourselves and more compassionate. And so for me, okay, it's so stupid and you're probably gonna think I'm an idiot after I tell you this, but one of the things that I've been doing to release control in my life, if you go to my Instagram at Vasini Kumar, I actually did a whole story on it. Uh, I make my bed every morning, okay? No big deal. Same. Same, great, awesome. <laughs> But like I'm militant about it, like and I and I don't like do anything until I make my bed. And what I realized was I don't make my bed because I like to have a made bed. I, I make my bed because I feel like a failure if I don't make my bed. And so for for me, like understanding why I do what I do is the most important thing um, that I can do for myself. And so so when it comes to like releasing control, stop intellectualizing. 
past three days, I haven't made my bed in the morning. I haven't. I've waited a few hours and then I come back and then I make it because, you know, that's just my journey, right? Everyone has their thing. Everyone has their thing that they're controlling about or they're trying to manage. You know, for me, it's like little things like making my bed. Like, can I still be happy and peaceful? Are you only giving me five more minutes? What the hell? I'm on a roll. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm just kidding. I got one more thing to say. Um, one, just one more thing, okay? All right, so just look at the areas in your life where you are intellectualizing and like thinking too much and then practice just doing OA, opposite action. That's it. Um, and then also, last thing. Well, one and a half last thing. Half, half, half. Okay, self-help fast. A self-help fast is uh, what I like to say, like for one whole week, don't, don't read anything about self-help, like don't Google how to live your life, don't, don't like listen to any guru or anything, don't fucking post memes or don't read memes, like just live, and I will do it along with you, because let me tell you, this has been the hardest thing for me, so if I have to do it, you have to do it, but like taking a self-help fast and just really helping myself and not needing it always from others is great. But we are gonna talk about community, like 45 seconds. Maybe a minute. Okay, so this is why I love community so much. Uh, I love that I'm in a room of people who are sober, right? Are we all sober here? Woo, most of us? Okay, great, no problem. I love that I'm in a room of people that are sober. Um, it takes a lot to meet, like, it takes a special person to consistently hurt themselves through alcohol and drugs. So there's something special there. Like, if, if we are the type of people, addicts and alcoholics can do the, a lot of harm to ourselves and we're still up and standing that must mean something. And so it's very important to me that I hang out with people and I associate myself with people who just get it, right? Like that's why like, I can go to any AA meeting, any location, I go to Bolden or I go to Riverbed or I'll go to Cherry Creek, but you walk into a room and you're like, oh my God, they get me. They just get me because we're effing crazy in our brains, right? Like we're just, we're just crazy and we just, need, we just need to be around people who get it and who we get. And so that's important and who will also call you out. You don't, you know, like for me, I always surrounded myself with people who co-signed my bullshit. It was, it's really easy hanging out with people who are like, yeah, go ahead, snort another line, who cares if you get a heart attack? No big deal. So it's important that we hang out with people who are gonna be like, listen, that's not the right path for you. Like, or like, be easy. Like, you know, just like take it easy, take a breath, pray, do whatever. And then also, um, this is definitely the last thing. When you're picking community, there are four things. People either, so you wanna look at the caliber of the people that you're hanging out with. People do one of four things, they either add, subtract, divide, or multiply you. You want people that are gonna add to your life, that, that are gonna you know, fill you up and not subtract and exhaust you. You know, when you leave certain people, you're like, oh my God, I need to go to sleep. Or, <laughs> or divide you, right? Like, so if you're trying to walk a certain path and you're like trying to be good, you know, just, just trying to be sober, trying to be whatever, and then you have person A come in and be like, hey, let's go do this instead. You don't want someone who's gonna split you. You wanna feel whole and you, you, like, you don't want to hang out with people who are gonna divide you from the path that you're on. And lastly, you wanna be with people who are gonna multiply you, right? So like, I know when I hang around certain people, like some of my entrepreneur colleagues and stuff like that, I'll leave their presence and I'll be like, yes, there's like 10 of me, right? Like I just feel multiplied. Like I just feel bigger than I already feel. So um, lastly, it's okay to outgrow people. That's it. And so if you feel like you've outgrown people that you've been hanging out with and you're like, I need some new friends or I need a new community, you probably do. So um, I'm here. I'll be here. So if you want to talk later, we can. Thank you. That's okay. Thank you.